What an incredible night for the Ohio State Buckeyes, 54-7. to What we learned? Well, we weren't learned an awful lot from Ohio State, who uh, most certainly did not have a bye week hangover on a night where their freshman stars again took center stage. We've got a lot to talk about. The Buckeyes go on the road in a rainy environment to open the second half of the year and absolutely blew the doors off of the Indiana Hoosiers. What we learned, Buckeye Breakdown, our post-game reaction live, coming up next here on Buckeyes Now. We've got the whole crew together as we cover Ohio State with our instant analysis from Ohio State. There's something that doesn't feel right. Unbelievable effort from him today. Is EJ Liddell going to crack the first team all Big Ten? I think he can be the guy. I'm not trying to start a quarterback controversy. He seems to have the durability. He certainly has the toughness. This is the question on a lot of people's minds here. Welcome to Buckeye Breakdown. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Buckeye Breakdown. Alongside Andrew Lind, I'm Brendan Gulick. What a fun night for the Ohio State Buckeyes. And frankly, for a, for a game that maybe didn't start with the highest of highs, it certainly ended in a comfortable win. The Buckeyes went down the field, their opening drive of the game, Andrew, and very much looked like the offense we've become accustomed to seeing now this last month. And then defense allowed a 15-play, 75-yard drive. That kind of made you think, Okay, Michael Penix isn't playing, but maybe Jack Tuttle's got the secret recipe because Indiana converted three long third downs, and then they had 53 yards on 39 plays the rest of the game, of which 17 came in the final few plays when they were running out the clock. What an unbelievable defensive effort uh, for a game that was 54-7 to and had a bunch of offensive fireworks. I thought the defense today really played well. How about just uh, up front here, your initial thoughts on tonight's game? Yeah, you had obviously mentioned Jack Tuttle had to come into this game and, and, and play instead of Michael Penix. Um, and I think, you know, coming off of last year with how well he played, you know, Ohio State really took it upon themselves to say, you know, we, we can't allow that to happen. Like, that's not the standard that we have here at Ohio State. And they really brought that into today's game. And then obviously once Tuttle, you know, took a hard hit um, on the touchdown pass. You know, they ended up going to a, a, a walk-on at one point, pretty much their four-string quarterback. And it seemed like Indiana at that point was just, you know, we're moving on. You know, there was people already leaving the stadium. I saw a, a pretty long, long backup of cars leaving leaving the parking lot there. So, you know, yeah, it was, in like it was the second quarter. Numbers. Yeah. It, yeah, I, I mean, look, you know, um, I think there's a lot of things about this game that we should sit here and say, okay, you know, probably expected that certain things were going to continue to go well. Um, but I also think Indiana's defense was the best defense the Buckeyes have played in the last five games now. Um, I think Oregon's defense is pretty much on par with Indiana, but given that Oregon's had a better year, that maybe their defense has played a bit better. Um, you know, people are going to look at Indiana and say they're two and five, they stink, the Buckeyes should, should pound them. I, I realize that Indiana's record isn't good. They've now lost five games to top 11 teams in the country. So they're clearly not one of the best teams in America. And by the way, their starting quarterback, who is absolutely, when healthy, one of the best. All American. Indiana's got talent. There's no doubt about that, but they they don't have a guy you know pulling the trigger right now at quarterback that is going to be able to get the job done. And I I think it became pretty obvious the offensive line for Indiana got overwhelmed. The quarterbacks weren't able to make plays quickly enough, you know, and and the game just sort of spiraled out of control. But for me, I was glad to see C.J. Stroud continue to to look healthy, to throw with confidence. He scrambled and kept his eyes downfield. You know, he found open targets, and he didn't seem to be bothered by the rain. And sometimes for young quarterbacks, that's not something you take for granted. So that was a that was a big takeaway for me. Yeah, and obviously for all of the, you know, the increased confidence that we've seen from CJ over the last four or five weeks, I think the same thing kind of happened with Indiana as well. But on the opposite side, you know, they, they've obviously played one of the toughest schedules in the country just based upon who they've lost to with, like you said, five of them being within the top 11. And, you know, it kind of just snowballs from there. 
You know, they obviously came into this season with high expectations given what had happened last year to then turn around and, you know, they had the, the really tough loss to Cincinnati. And they mentioned it on the broadcast tonight when the linebacker McFadden went out with the, with the targeting, it just kind of all started going downhill from there. And he, you know, he obviously is a very talented player and kind of the key to the defense. And then obviously tonight they were missing both of their starting cornerbacks as well. So then that obviously plays a big role in, in kind of how Ohio State is just able to. It kind of reminds me about like what Mike Loxley said after the Maryland game. You know, they're just so wide open, they're jumping out of airplanes. And it's kind of the same thing when you don't have established quarterbacks in there. You know, people who are, are, are consistently getting playing time, they don't know how to cover what is the best wide receivers unit in the country. All right, Andrew, I think we have to address this now because it's happened several weeks in a row here. You've got this body of work where Ohio State has scored 50 or more points in four consecutive games. I realize we're talking about games against Akron, Rutgers, Maryland, and a depleted Indiana defense. It's not Georgia's defense. It's not Alabama's defense. But we are talking about scholarship Division I football players. They don't stink, okay? They're they're not good. They're, they haven't been great teams this year and and they certainly aren't the best defenses the Buckeyes are going to see this year but there there is some level of when you're executing at that high of a level that consistently that has to open some eyes and I am a little bit I, I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated by some of the comments I've seen from from Ohio State haters on you know well they haven't played anybody yet I get it. They haven't played maybe a top 10 defense in the country. In the first couple of weeks, this incredibly inexperienced team was still trying to figure it out. But right now, there's not a team in the country that that legitimately scares me. Georgia's defense is the real deal. Okay. Alabama's a very good team. Cincinnati's a very good team. I, I don't think there's a team in the country that Ohio State can't beat. And I think they are absolutely one of the top four teams in the country right now. Nobody is slowing this team down. So I'm I'm at the point where I'm I'm ready to say, hey, I know it hasn't been against the highest level of competition, but they've done it consistently enough, and we've seen enough growth the last five games that I love the projection of this thing moving forward. And I think when the Ohio State Buckeyes – you know, find that uh, I guess it's in a, a week and a half now that that first college football playoff ranking comes out. As long as they take care of business next week, I'd be stunned if they're not in the top four. Yeah, and kind of like you mentioned, I think that they're just clicking on all cylinders at this point where it doesn't really matter so much about who they're playing, but rather, you know, whether or not they're able to execute themselves. And I think that, you know, you mentioned Georgia and, you know, they're only averaging or giving up like five or six points a game. But I think Ohio State is obviously way more talented than than any offense they've played. I mean, they only beat Clemson by seven points and didn't score an offensive touchdown, you know, in that in that game. And look where Clemson is now. So you know, Georgia is really good defensively, but I mean, they're not going to be able to stop this Ohio State offense. It reminds me a lot of of LSU in 2019. You know, it was one of those things where even if Ohio State would have made it to the national championship with all the talent that they had that year had some, you know, things went different in the, in the Fiesta Bowl against Clemson. Like, I don't think that Ohio State would have ever stopped LSU. And and that's that's kind of the thing that I, I, I start to see in this offense as well. And and I'm, I think Oklahoma is probably the perfect example because they have the last few years been a great offense, the, the last decade, they've been a great offense with a defense that hasn't been able to perform at a high enough level. And the couple times they've gotten in the playoff, they've gotten whacked. They've never won a college football playoff game. And you look at the Sooners again this year and think, gee, if they play against a good offense, that's the most vulnerable undefeated team I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, I, I, I'm i not sitting here and ready to pound on the bully pulpit and say the Buckeyes are going to win a national championship. Let's pump the brakes on that a little bit. But I am saying the Buckeye offense is the real deal. They lead the country in scoring. They lead the country in total offensive yards. They lead the country in yards per game and in yards per play. They have so many weapons. The the offensive line, I, I was kind of laughing. They said it on TV tonight, and I had the conscious thought myself. It almost looks like you've got five offensive tackles, and one of them happens to snap the football. I mean, again, I realize Indiana's defensive line isn't going to be otherworldly, 
but they weren't getting penetration at all, all night long. And I don't care how good or inexperienced your quarterback is, no matter where you are on that spectrum. Man, if you get four or five seconds to throw the football and you're a scholarship quarterback at a D1 school, you're going to find an open guy. That's just I mean, those guys are good enough to do that, let alone the level that CJ Stroud is playing at right now is ridiculously good. I don't know what happened to Stroud in the week uh, that, that he sat out against Akron. You know, I was I was a little bit critical of him the first three weeks. I said that I, I liked some of the things I saw. I wanted to see more from him. And I was I was in the boat of let's see more about what Kyle McCord can do because CJ had been missing too many times high over the middle of the field for my comfort level. Whatever happened from that game he took off against Akron forward, he has literally been the best player in college football. Like yeah. the best bar not. Sorry, I had to get off uh, get off my high horse there for a second. Go ahead, jump in. No, you're fine. Um, you know, it, it's definitely one of those things that you know I was also very critical of him as well following that org game, and I I also was was expecting more from him. And I think you know, like I said, I think after the Rutgers game, um, and kind of like offensive observations, maybe I was a little too critical of him because he didn't have you know the the experience of playing in blowout games or or just any experience really last year. You know, I think that that. He, he's grown up a lot. You know, those, those non-conference teams before he took that game off were kind of his, you know, you're getting thrown into the fire and you figure out how, how it goes at that point. And after he took that off, you know, kind of saw that, like, you know, he just needed to maybe calm down, get, you know, get healthy, all that kind of stuff, and, and really put it together. And then once he figured out how to put it all together, there's no, there's no real coming back from that, if that makes sense. Like, he just is continuing to build upon that and, and, and really be, like you said, I mean, besides, I'm I'm thinking Pickett from from Pittsburgh. Like, they have to be one and two for the Heisman right now. I I would listen to a, a conversation about Bryce Young, but I don't know. I I've been more impressed with CJ than I've been with Bryce Young. And here's a, another perfect example: all the preseason hype about Spencer Rattler and DJ Uyunglele. It is October 24th. It's really October 23rd, but it's two minutes after midnight as we shoot this live. It's not even November. And Oklahoma and Clemson have already benched their starting quarterbacks. Clemson is lucky to be over 500. They they legitimately should be three and four. They, they got so lucky to beat Boston College when the Eagles choked away the end of that game. Um, and, and again, Oklahoma, I mean, I realize they keep winning. And at the end of the day, all you can do is beat the teams on your schedule. I've said that a hundred times. I, I'm not going to knock a team necessarily for winning, but my gosh, if they don't look like the most vulnerable undefeated team I think I've ever seen. Um, in college football right now, this is a great point that uh, Yakov brings up. You don't need a great defense to win a title. You need a great offense. I totally, totally agree with that because in college football, this has become an offensive game. Your defense needs to be good enough to limit an elite offense on the other side. And that's why you saw Ohio State struggle last year. They couldn't find ways to contain an unbelievable Alabama offense. Um, and, and that had a lot to do with some of the injuries the Buckeyes were playing with. And then, of course, you know, you lose Trey Sermon last year on the first play of the game in the national championship. And Justin Fields is banged up. And, you know, we go right on down the line. Um, you don't need an elite defense. It helps, but you don't need an elite defense to win a national title. And it's part of the reason why now I I did not believe this after week two because I thought this Buckeye team had such a long way to come. I am wildly impressed with the amount of product, uh, productivity that they've put together in the last six weeks between five games and a bye week. This is a totally different football team than what we saw through two weeks. And I absolutely believe they are capable of winning a national championship. I don't know if it's going to happen, but they deserve to be in that conversation for sure. Well, I think after the Oregon loss too, you know, that the, it seemed like their ceiling was maybe the Rose Bowl. You know, you maybe lose another game along the way just because everything isn't working, especially defensively. I, I said at the time, it reminded me a lot of 2018 where, you know, the offense was, was putting up, of outrageous numbers behind Dwayne Haskins, but then the defense, you know, obviously faltered in the in the Purdue loss, and that ended up being what what cost them the season. And I kind of felt the same way then. But then, as the season progresses, you see the teams that they're going to face. Like 
nobody in the Big Ten can keep up with Ohio State offensively. And that's that's the thing. Like I asked on the broadcast today, you know, who the who the biggest challenger to Ohio State is. I mean, sure, if you want, you know, you could say Michigan because that's what they did, but they said, I mean, Michigan just runs the ball and they're very one dimensional in that aspect. So, you know, you can't tell me that a team that's running the ball is going to be able to keep up with Ohio State in all facets of the game. Penn State looked as vulnerable as ever today, you know, obviously losing that that the nine overtime game. So Michigan State will learn a lot about them against against Michigan next week. So, you know, the, it just doesn't seem like the schedule is, is, is as, as as tough as it did before. I, I don't want to sound elitist, okay? But I, I look at just the last couple of weeks in the Big Ten. Iowa loses to Purdue, right? <laughs> Tough loss for the Hawkeyes, who I think are a very good football team, but I don't think – I thought Iowa was worthy of being ranked number two based on who they had beaten, but I never believed that Iowa was truly the second-best team in the country. They lost to Purdue. That quickly squashed that. Purdue, who's ranked for the first time in a million years, loses to Wisconsin, whose offense is not good. They're not good at all. Their defense is good. Their offense has been really, really below average this year. Um, I, you know, Penn State. Penn State was certainly looked like the better team against Iowa when Sean Clifford was in the game. And as soon as he got hurt, they were totally outclassed by the Hawkeyes. So Penn State shows they don't have the depth, and, and they come back and – I mean, I'm man. I'm not trying to like demean anybody, but they lost to Illinois. Come on, right? Like, right. I, I I just I look at the rest of the Big Ten right now as this is a good league with a lot of really competitive teams. That seriously, any team on any given day has a really good chance to win, unless you're playing Ohio State. Like they, they I'm not saying the Buckeyes are going to win every game they ever play, right? But like. There is such a clear gap when you watch a Tom Allen coached Indiana team that plays as hard as anybody in the conference and they've got some talent. They got steamrolled. There were times I literally watched the game and thought this is an NFL team playing against a college team. Not that every every player on the Buckeyes roster is going to be an NFL player, but it was it was such a wide gap between where Ohio State is and where the rest of the league is. And I'm not saying they're never going to lose again, but, man, it's it would be a major, major upset if the Buckeyes lose a game before the college football playoff this year. And, uh, you know, to your point about the, the comment that, that they made on TV about Michigan and their defense, yeah, Michigan's defense is much improved. And actually, I thought today was probably Michigan's best performance of the year. They got off to a slow start, but they recovered nicely, and, you know, they they – fairly thoroughly beat Northwestern, even though it was only 33 to seven. It was a pretty one-sided game. I don't look at Michigan and I don't get scared. I just don't. And and we can talk more about that later. But I, I the, the point here I'm trying to make is that I just think in a non-elitist way of saying it, I think this is a very competitive league with mm-hmm. Ohio State as an outlier. And I just don't think most of these teams have a chance to beat the Buckeyes right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, a lot of that has to do with kind of kind of the tier, if you will. Like Ohio State is so far tier one, and then you have all these other teams that are like, if Ohio State wasn't in the league, it would be really fun. Like it would be really competitive. You would see teams, you know, maybe one year win the Big Ten, the next year not. You know, those kind of things. It would it would almost be like the Big Ten West, how you know Northwestern seems to win it every other year, and then Wisconsin mm-hmm. seems to win it every other year, and those kind of things. Like it would be really fun if Ohio State wasn't in it, but that. I mean, that's the thing. Like, Ohio State just – they've all, they've recruited so much better than everybody. The talent gap is there. Like, it, that just – you know, I, I would almost say in a way that there, there's certain positions where I think Ohio State can play their second-team offense, second-team defenders, and, you know, still come away with a, a pretty convincing win against other Big Ten teams. But, you know, to that point, I actually kind of think Purdue might be the biggest threat to Ohio State just because their offense, I think, has the ability, especially wide receiver, which I think is – is actually no, you know, no disrespect to the Detroit Free Press for for saying that uh, Michigan State has the best uh, wide receivers unit in the in the in the conference. I actually think it's it's Purdue that is is second to Ohio State, so that that could really make it a you know an interesting game. 
Yeah, David Bell's the real deal. Absolutely, for sure. He is one of the best receivers in college football, and he's a problem. The Buckeyes have to get ready for him, but they don't play him for a, a month, or I guess it's three weeks now, so I'm, I'm not going to get too caught up on him yet. Um, yeah. But to your point about depth, Evan Pryor ran really well tonight. Evan Pryor is Ohio State's fifth running back. Mm-hmm. Fifth. He, he ran hard downhill, yards after contact, Every single time he touched the ball, you know, it's, it's, it's a depth thing. And, you know, it's, it's kind of an embarrassment of riches for the Buckeyes. The reality is they do play in this league um, and they are going to be the favorites until somebody can recruit consistently at the level that they are. But I am impressed with the humility that the Buckeyes approach this with, because again, to Tom Luganville's point on TV tonight, you could see Ryan Day and Tony Alford and and Al Washington coaching these guys hard when the game was not even close. The outcome was never, ever in doubt from the middle of the second quarter on. And yet coaching guys hard to not miss little details when they're getting valuable reps in the fourth quarter because that's what held Ohio State back last year. They had the pieces they thought they could use to win a national championship and it, it just didn't manifest itself because they didn't have a chance to build any depth. Mm-hmm. This year, they had those non-conference games, and and thankfully, the way the schedule is shaken out, played Rutgers and Maryland and Indiana and Akron in, in four consecutive games where you scored 50 points, and you can get the second half of your roster in for, for like legitimate stretches of play. I don't know what the number is. I'd have to look it up, but I think – I think uh, Jack Miller and Kyle McCord have both gotten in maybe all four of the last four games. You're playing three quarterbacks a game. Again, the development of talent deep on the roster. I, I got a wooden table in front of me, okay? I'm knocking on wood. If C.J. Stroud gets hurt, you got to have a guy that can keep this thing going, right? You certainly don't want it to happen, but you have to be able to continue moving forward uh, if one bad play happens. Um, and, and, you know, that's why Ohio state is considered one of the top teams in college football every year, because they develop their talent better than just about anybody else. Well, and I think there's two really good points there as well. And, you know, we talked about the talent gap that exists in the big 10. And I think that one, you really see it in the freshmen. Like you literally can just name off more than a dozen freshmen who are, are already making an impact on this roster. And, you know, that, that speaks to the future and like what, how good they're going to be moving forward. If they're getting that valuable experience this year and, you know, there are like, you know, they, they could get valuable reps in playoff games or those kind of things. So, you know, that that's only going to pay off in the future, but that, you know, you talked about just being able to, you know, get them in the game. And Ryan Day talked about this afterwards too, you know, being able to sit there and say like, we're going to coach these kids up all the way until the end, <clears throat> you know, that makes you comfortable when, if a player goes down, for example, Luke Pippler, knock on wood goes down. You know that, you know, you have Harry Miller, you have even Toby Wilson at this point. He's been getting so many reps as a freshman walk-on that you would feel comfortable with him going in, you know, performing to a, a standard that Ohio State has set. I, uh, I I think we continue to see that this team, you know, has the pieces, continues to take the right steps, didn't did not look past Indiana tonight. I mean, you got this Penn State game looming on the horizon there's no doubt that as soon as the Buckeyes lost to Oregon, you know, they flipped the page and turned it to Tulsa. But you got to feel pretty good about your chances to beat Tulsa, Akron, Rutgers, Maryland, and probably Indiana, considering Michael Penix was hurt. The Penn State game was absolutely the next big game on the schedule. And coming out of a bye week, as healthy as they've been all year, thankfully. You know, this this was a chance for Ohio State to pick up where they left off and try to take some momentum into that game at home against Penn State. And I'm telling you, the emotional letdown that Penn State is having right now after, you know, not playing well against Iowa as soon as Sean Clifford got hurt to going home and losing to Illinois. Again, I'm not trying to downplay Illinois here, but they have been the worst team in the Big Ten for several years. They're not good. I honestly think there were bad Rutgers teams that were better than Illinois. You lost at home to Illinois. Try selling that to your fan base 
and try yeah. try convincing your kids after losing that game that they're still playing for something. Penn State probably isn't going to play in a New Year's Six game anymore. They just lost back to back games. I, I realize it's a big game. It's It doesn't have the same weight that it had prior to this afternoon's loss. Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of that has to do, I think, with, with Sean Clifford's injury because if he goes, if he doesn't go down against Iowa, I think that they win that game. And he did not look anything like, you know, what, what he looked like earlier in the season um, in today's game. I, I'm actually surprised that they didn't pull him at one point just because, you know, it felt like he was actually hindering the offense. But I think the biggest thing for Ohio State is that they can't sit there and look at this game and say that this is representative of what Penn State is because that, that's 100% not true. You know, you, you can't sit there and say that you you wouldn't expect Penn State to have nine opportunities to score from the three-yard line in, in overtime and, and not put that in. So that I don't think that you can watch this tape and say this is the Penn State that they're going to see next week. So, you know, they obviously have to come into the game still thinking it's a top 10 matchup because if they don't, then, you know, that that's when you get upset and all of this stuff that we're talking about right now doesn't, you know, has no purpose. I, I agree that, um, you know, Penn State is not as bad as the surface level loss to Illinois looks. And I said all week, just in conversations with folks, that I thought it was dumb that Penn State was going to play Sean Clifford today. Because if he was if he was hurt, mm-hmm. and that's why you lost to Iowa. I mean, as soon as he came out of the game, that game flipped, right? Yeah. To me, he needs to be a hundred percent if you have any chance to beat the Buckeyes. I was really surprised that Sean Clifford played today against Illinois, and then they lost to Illinois. Mm-hmm. So you know, insult to injury at that point. Yeah, just a, a tough, tough scene. Um, you know, I to be honest with you, for as excited as I am for Ohio State to host Penn State under the lights, big game next weekend, um, I'm actually probably more excited to watch Michigan, Michigan State, and just see those two teams go at each other. It's the best competition that either of those two teams will have played all year. I don't care what their ranking is in the AP. Michigan State is as good a running attack as Michigan is seed for sure. And I think Michigan's defense is absolutely the best defense that Michigan State has played so far. I'm not totally sold on Michigan State's depth yet. And I've mentioned a few times, I don't think that Cade McNamara and, and J.J. McCarthy as a you know combination of quarterbacks is the right answer. I think if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have one. And it's not like they're running specific packages for one guy. They're just... Mm-hmm flipping them in and out. And I think quarterback has obviously been the problem for Jim Harbaugh since he took over. And I don't think he's figured it out yet. I think both those guys have some talent, but I don't like the fact they're bouncing back and forth and neither of them have really run away with the job. Um, Next week's game is going to be very, very interesting in East Lansing. That's, that's a game to watch for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's going to tell us a lot about both teams and, and whether or not Ohio state has to worry about one more than the other necessarily. But I think you made a really good point when you, you brought up Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy because I think that that's the reason that Ohio State shouldn't really fear anybody in the Big Ten, and it's because there isn't really a great quarterback outside of C.J. Stroud, or at least on Ohio State roster. I don't think that anybody is is capable of putting up you know 400 yards and and five touchdowns in a single game, and I, I certainly don't expect it from from this Michigan Michigan State game. I mean, it, in fact, it would probably end up being like a 20 to 13, you know one of those type of games. So it'll still be really fun to watch, you know, really interesting to see about, you know, which team is really a threat to Ohio State in that that respect. Again, man, Michigan beat Rutgers 20 to 13. Look what Ohio State did to Rutgers. Mm-hmm. You know, Mi- Michigan is fine. They are, a, they are a good football team. They are not even close to being on Ohio State's level. Could they beat the Buckeyes? Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. It is highly improbable, in my opinion. Um, I think Ohio State does a great job of not overlooking opponents. I think Ryan Day and his staff do a really, really good job of making sure the guys understand that they need to respect who they're playing uh, and and maximize their opportunities because the Buckeyes have been snake bitten the last couple of years in the college football playoff. And if they want to find a way to be the ones holding the trophy at the end of the year, they can't 
take any game, any snap, any rep for granted. You've got to find a way to be your best because you have to elevate to the highest level you can play at the end of the year or you're going to lose. And we've seen that the last two years uh, with teams, with, with rosters that were absolutely good enough to win it all. Ohio State in 2019 was absolutely good enough to win the national championship. And last year, if they were healthy, absolutely good enough to win the whole thing. But it wasn't quite enough. I don't think anybody at the beginning of the season was saying this could be a national championship caliber team. We had no idea who the starting quarterback was going to be until you know a week before the season started. And that person was, you know, whoever it was, obviously hadn't played with any valuable uh, playing time. But what we've seen through these first seven games now is awfully impressive. Um, and and I think Ohio State's ceiling is as high as it's ever been. Um, you know, I, I saw a comment here of something that I, I wrote about and I wanted to chime in on this. Rasmataz says, the new two-point conversion rule for overtime stinks. It's supposed to limit injuries, but nine so-called overtimes made for bad football and Illinois quarterback Sitkowski got hurt anyways. Yes, Sitkowski got hurt. I hated to see that. I don't like seeing guys get hurt. I actually kind of like it. You know, they they played – you play a 60-minute game. You you have – you have an overtime period with normal rules governing play. You have a second overtime period with normal rules that only stipulate afterward you got to go for two um, mm-hmm. just to kind of get the game moving, right? And and if you're still tied after an hour's worth of play and two overtimes, like the game is obviously coming down to make or break you know, decisions anyways. I don't need to see a team that has taken 70 snaps – continue to slog it out to maybe kick a field goal or maybe score on a broken play. Mm-hmm. I actually, I mean, it, it, don't get me wrong. It was wild. Like it was, what are we watching here? I, mm-hmm. I, I mean, the whole time I'm watching the game, I'm like, this is awesome. What's going on? Yeah. How are you throwing? Oh my God, he's a yard short. Like it was entertaining for me. I, I loved it. I really enjoyed that. It was weird. It was different, but I really liked it. See, I, I'm really conflicted about it because I, I've always loved college football's overtime rules. Just, you know, just the fact that teams get to kind of go back and forth and, you know, just it, it can end up something crazy like LSU and Texas A&M a couple of years ago when it was like 73 to 71 and seven overtimes. Like that is what made college football great to me. And I think at first glance, I, I was I was I even said it on Twitter. I was not happy with the overtime rules because I just think that it, it kind of it speeds things up in a way that I think feels unnatural. But at the same time, like I could not take my eyes off of it because it was just like one of those things like it just one play, bam, one play, bam, one play, bam. And then like it, it just felt like it was just so fast paced and it was such a different thing that it was kind of exciting. But I think there's still so many, so many issues with it, too, because it seemed like every time Illinois had the ball first, they wanted to get away from Penn State's end zone. So they had to walk 100 yards to the other side of the field and then they do that and then they would not score. And then Penn State would get the ball first. And they go back to their side because they wanted Illinois to go in the in the in the student section. And it, it is like there that just seemed like so it's a little gimmicky. I, yeah. I, I can imagine like, you know, if you have a nosebleed seat and you're watching that, you're probably like, what is going on? Like, come on, yeah. this has to, you know, something's gotta give somewhere along the way. But I don't know. I mean, I I am all for exploring different ways to come up with a better solution. It's the first time I've seen it. I don't know if it's the best answer, but I also don't know if the game where you, you referenced the, the two 70 point game or two 70 point final scores. Does it, it, does it really matter if it's a, you know, both teams keep scoring touchdowns or both teams hitting two point conversions. Um, I, I would be interested to see some analytics on, you know, previous mm-hmm. overtime games and and how long they've gone, how many extra plays get run. You know, mm-hmm. it's a game that's nine overtimes, the equivalent of like an old four overtime game or maybe even a three overtime game because you really only ran six extra plays or I guess seven in overtimes three through nine, right? You know, you got the first two that are what yeah. they are. Then overtimes three through nine, you run one play in each. Well, you might run seven plays in an overtime period. So that game could have looked the same as a regular, you know, three overtime yeah. game. 
Um, I think that's it, it had the potential yeah. to end the game on every play, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd hate to see a seven and play 25 yard drive in overtime. Like that would be <laughs> sure. That would be something else. But I mean, ultimately it was probably a three or four normal overtime game. So it wasn't abnormal in that, that aspect, but I think that there's got to be a sweet spot that you find somewhere. And I think that they kind of did that when they said, okay, you have to go for two once you get to the third or fourth overtime because you were still, you still had to prove your worth to get to the end zone. Like that's the part that I don't like about it is it is only three yards. Like, you know, that, that shouldn't be an issue. Like that, that game should have never went into nine overtimes because getting three yards, like Travion Henderson averages three times that on a single run. <laughs> so, I mean, Ohio State would have ended that in, in on the very first overtime. So, I'm sorry, the, well, the third overtime. But I, I do like the idea that you have to get 25 yards to get that because, like I said, the three yards just seems very, very cheap in, in that respect. I, I'm willing to listen to other arguments. Again, I'm not 100% sold on the idea, although I did find it really fun and entertaining. Uh, I do uh, I do hear you, Razmataz, on when you bring it down to a two-point play, gives the underdog a better chance to get a fluke win. You know what? Play better during the 60 minutes of the regular game. That's, that's kind of where I stand on that. Um, some of my favorite plays in the history of college football are a little fluky. I will – until the day I die, I will always remember the Statue of Liberty play when Boise State, you know, mm-hmm. beat Oklahoma. It is one of my all-time favorite plays. It was fluky. It was an underdog. I don't care. I thought it was great. Um, yeah. You know, if you're they good enough to your regular play, then do it. What's that? I said they also didn't have to go three yards. <laughs> yeah, so. it's true. Like, it's true. It's true. Let's yeah. get back toward the Buckeyes here. I, I don't want to get too far off topic, even though Ohio State's playing Penn State next week. Um, there's a lot of talk about the defense because this is now five consecutive games that Ohio State has not allowed a def- – uh, the, the Ohio State defense has not allowed a rushing touchdown. Considerable improvement, okay? Where do you stand on – what you need to see from the defense versus what you have seen from the offense. You know the offense is national championship caliber good. What have you seen from the defense that gives you comfort that they're either trending in the right direction and will continue to, or they've made up so much ground that now they're serviceable enough, good enough, that you think this defense can be good enough for this team to win? Yeah, I mean, last year, the, the one thing that really stood out to me was the fact that the defensive line wasn't able to get the pressure that we're maybe consistently used to seeing from a Larry Johnson-led unit. You know, they were always right there, but they could never make the tackle, you know, or the sack. Like, it, it they were just that close. And especially in the last couple of games, it just literally feels like they're pinning their ears back, just running through offensive linemen and, and and really making it hard for the quarterback. And, you know, that right there is where what is going to be key because, you know, for as much as, as like Sean Wade got a lot of crap last year for and just the secondary in general because of how it played, you know, if if there was more pressure on the quarterback throughout the year, they wouldn't have to be in coverage so much. And I think that that helps obviously on the back end. And it's just kind of a, you know, a rolling thing. Get pressure up front. The back end doesn't have to work as hard, and it, and it works all cohesively. So, you know, that that's really the thing for me. You know, Zach Harrison was in there today. You know, even um, you had Ty Hamilton in there as well. So, you know, when you're getting into your third and fourth string players at those positions and you're rotating and they're all making an impact, that that is a, a significant thing. I'll tell you, the other guy I really want to stick up for right now is Tommy Eichenberg because Tommy got – raked over the coals after, you know, three anywhere from average to poor performances in the first three games of the year, you know, as you're starting Mike linebacker against Tulsa and did not register a tackle. I don't know how that happens. Um, I have always liked Tommy. I think he's a good player and I just thought he got off to a bad start. And tonight I thought he played really, really well. Thought this was his best game as a Buckeye so far. Uh, And, and just, you know, continue to be impressed with the growth in that room. Again, there's a lot of headlines around Dallas Gant and, and Kayvon Pope not being with the Buckeyes anymore. Um, Steel Chambers, 
might be the most excitable player on the defensive side of the ball. You know, you you, you kind of find your eyes drifting toward him pre-snap whenever he's on the field because you just you just know he's going full throttle. It doesn't matter. He is all gas, all juice every time. Um, you know, Cody Simons continued to play well. I, I I just I like the the development from that unit, which was so necessary after a couple of bad weeks. But Tommy Eichenberg in particular, I thought played well. That unit specifically kind of reminds me of, of just a conversation we had around CJ Stroud and what they were seeing in practice versus maybe what we were seeing early in games. And I kind of get the same sense with the linebackers as well. You know, maybe maybe it took them a while to to finally turn into what they are now. But I, it's clear that the dynamics have changed there where they are just full of confidence and everybody who comes into the game knows their role and knows, you know, exactly what they need to do. You know, I wonder, you know, maybe Dallas Gant and Kayvon Pope leaving is, you know, it's obviously not great when any player feels that they didn't get what they maybe felt they were promised or, you know, just what they worked for. But at the same time, like having not having that in the room anymore is significant too. You know, you don't necessarily have those guys who feel that, like, they're entitled to or deserving of something. And these guys know that they have to work for what they get. So, it, you know, it's just kind of a new di- dynamic there. And, you know, it's really great to see them stepping up and, you know, playing their, putting their best foot forward. This is a fun team to watch right now. And uh, I, I am as excited as I could have genuinely hoped to be for the rest of the year, because uh, I think like a lot of Buckeye fans, man, after two weeks, wasn't looking great. And, you know, all hope was not lost, but my gosh, the the Buckeyes had a long way to go and needed a lot of things to go their way if they were going to climb back into a college football playoff conversation. Um, Just because of the the youth and inexperience of the team, not because a week two loss is insurmountable. Um, and, And the combination of a lot of other teams around the country not looking nearly as dominant as we've seen in past years and the growth we've seen from this team, I, I think they are absolutely right at the top of the conversation uh, for the college football playoff. And the reality is they can't afford to stub their toe, so they can't afford to take anybody lightly because if they lose again, they're probably not getting in the playoff. It's it's that simple. A two-loss team has never gotten in the playoff, and there's going to be too many other one-loss teams that are going to have a good resume or a good shot to get there. Um so they can't afford to just say, hey, you know, Penn State has lost two in a row. We're going to take this team at home, no problem. They got to lay it on them. Um, mm-hmm. And and I, I think that makes it fun because you know you're going to get the most focused effort you can get um, because your goals are still attainable, but there's no margin for error anymore. Uh, and for a, a, a young team that maybe doesn't know any better, I think that's kind of fun. Uh, mm-hmm. And I know Buckeye Nation is is looking forward to watching the rest of this season. I think you made a really good point there too. Mm-hmm. You know, with, with just it being a young team, you know, maybe not knowing any better and knowing the pressure that comes with it, they play really loose. And there isn't like they know that they can't lose a game. Like that's understood just because of the situation. But at the same time, I don't think that that kind of rules their thoughts. I don't think that they they that they allow that to be the thing that they think about all the time. They just go out there and play, and they do what they're supposed to do, and they know that if they do what they're supposed to do on a weekly basis, then the rest of it will take care of itself. A lot of interesting comments, and I, I love the conversation, guys. I, I hope you'll keep that up. Uh, we'll go here for a couple more minutes. In the meantime, if you haven't yet, we'd really appreciate it. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We do content like this all the time. We love to interact with you guys and and uh, you know certainly cover – post game and cover team uh, the, the team as closely as we can would, would appreciate your support if you'd be willing to subscribe uh, and like the video um you know other guys I think that maybe have have stepped up into more meaningful roles here lately I know JT Tui Moloau has seen the field a lot I was super psyched to see him get a sack tonight sometimes you know that you, you gotta you gotta feel like you're being rewarded for not just getting on the field and you know, causing some chaos. You, you like to see that the, the stat sheet said you got a sack. You like to to feel like you're getting home. And um, I think there's a lot more of that in his future. Yeah, I know his parents were uh, in attendance today, too. I saw they flew out to Indianapolis. So, you know, um, it was obviously a big thing for him to to get that sack with him and with them in attendance. And, 
you know, it, it really is just one of those things where you see all these players. We talked about this earlier tonight, you know, seeing them all kind of put it together and, and know that they're talented and, and, and just the future that, that Ohio State has in front of it with all these freshmen and, and just underclassmen who are who are playing a significant role in where Ohio State is right now. Because, you know, if you have Travion Henderson and Tylee Williams against Tulsa, maybe that game is different. You know, so there, there's so many examples of that. And, it, and it's awesome to see them all, you know, stepping up in, in big ways. Like, you know, you kind of expected what was a top-ranked class, uh, according to Sports Illustrated All-American, you know, and and – you know, it really just them them taking that step forward. This uh, this offense is so fast and has such an explosive nature that it honestly feels like anywhere on the field they can score. Um, you even saw a couple weeks ago an 85 yard non scoring play. Um, I mean, they they just have the ability whether it's a long pass, uh, you know, and and it's caught in the end zone or. Travion Henderson's 70 yard screen pass and mostly run for a touchdown against Minnesota. Um, the, the athleticism, the speed, the home run nature of a lot of the skill positions uh, on this offense. It's just fun to watch because you always feel like if there's time on the clock, they got a shot um, mm-hmm. and it's going to take an unbelievable defensive effort to slow this team down. You, you cross your fingers for good health and, um, you know the team's going to be prepared. You know they're well coached, and you hope you keep getting good shots to to as Ryan Day says to keep swinging because um, this team is as fun to watch right now as as any Ohio State team has been in recent memory. Yeah, and I think that just that quick strike ability is actually going to come in in handy here in one of these next couple of games. Like I just feel like you know they might be in a situation where they need to go into halftime with some momentum you know, get the ball back maybe in, in, in their own territory. And Ryan Day said, you know what, we have the weapons to go down and get some points right now that's going to spark us in the second half. And I think that, you know, that, that we're really going to see that come into play here soon. Ohio State 54, Indiana 7. couple of numbers before we wrap up. The Buckeyes 539 total yards of offense. Indiana had 128. And again, 75 of those were on the first drive of the game. They had 53 yards the rest of the game, and 17 of those 53 yards came on the final four running plays uh, when Indiana was running out the clock. They basically had 40 yards of offense in meaningful situations through three and a half quarters. That is ridiculous. Uh, It's legitimately about a yard per play. Um, Great defensive effort tonight. Again, I realize Indiana was playing their second, third, and fourth string quarterbacks. You still got to go out and execute, and I thought the Buckeyes did a really good job there. C.J. Stroud, 21-28 for 266, four touchdowns, no picks. Not going to complain about that. Um, Every single drive that C.J. Stroud has been on the field since the beginning of the Rutgers game, Ohio State has scored, and only one of those drives has resulted in a field goal. They've got, I think it's 20 touchdowns in 21 drives uh, over the last three games with C.J. Stroud got in the offense. I, I mean, can't ask for more. I guess it could be 21, right? I mean, like, what what do you need? What what could be better than that? Like, they're not turning mm-hmm. it over. They're scoring, and they're mauling their opponent. So um, awfully impressive there. Kyle McCord and Jack Miller got opportunities tonight. They threw for 86 yards when they got in the game. Uh, Travion Henderson scored three times today, only touched the ball 10 times total. He is quickly approaching Maurice Claret's all time Ohio State freshman touchdown uh, record. He's only a couple shy with five games to go in the regular season. Mayan Williams and Evan Pryor tonight combined 19 carries for 108 yards and a touchdown. Uh, the Buckeyes did not have a 100 yard receiver in this game. Jackson Smith and Jigba, six catches for 99 yards. Garrett Wilson, five for 59. Rucker, two touchdowns, five for 47. Marvin Harrison Jr., Mecca Igbuka, Chris Olave, Evan Pryor all had two receptions, one apiece for Cade Stover, Travion, Chris Booker, and uh, Joe Royer at the end of the game as well. 539 yards of offense. Ho-hum, just another day for the Buckeyes, uh, racking up some big, uh, big video game numbers. Your final thoughts here as we wrap up, buddy. Yeah, I mean, it's really cool to see Chris Olave, you know, go from an unheralded three-star wide receiver. You know, I'm glad this Indiana game is behind us because I'm tired of hearing about the 
the uh, relationship with Jack Tuttle. I think we've heard that for the last <laughs> three years. But, um, you know, it's really cool to see him him go from that to then becoming and, and approaching Ohio State's all-time lead touchdown receptions. Um, and I know he has four more to go to tie David Boston, five more if he wants to have the record himself, which, I mean, I fully expect to come in the next, you know, three weeks, you know, so – um, and then obviously Jeremy Ruckert, you know, it's nice to see him getting involved. He does a lot of the dirty work that, you know, you don't, you don't really see it. And as you're watching the game, but then for him to get rewarded, you know, throughout the, throughout this game and, and just, you know, to continue to remain humble and, and just do what he needs to do. Like that, that is a very impactful, important part of this team. I, uh, I fully recognize the Buckeyes have not played the hardest strength of schedule yet because, they they drew some of the um, you know some of the lower tier Big Ten teams earlier in their schedule. Um, I realize Rutgers, Maryland, Indiana, and Minnesota have not achieved at a high level this season. But I think if you watch closely, if you're actually watching the games, you're seeing noticeable growth on both sides of the ball. And I I don't think it's fair to just sit here and say. You know, Ohio State's not good enough. Show me something against a good team. I, I really don't think that's fair criticism at this point. Maybe after the Akron game, but not after what they've done now three weeks in a row against mm-hmm. Power 5 teams. I realize they, you know, Rutgers and Maryland and Indiana aren't scaring a lot of people. I get that, um, but significantly different um, and and plenty of reason to be excited here as we move into the rest of the season. A lot more coverage coming for you on BuckeyesNow.com. We hope you'll check that out throughout the course of the night and tomorrow. We'll be back tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. with another live stream with uh, basically our, hey, we slept on it. Here's some of the things we thought about overnight that uh, we didn't have a chance to talk about here this evening. This was awesome. Had great audience participation. uh, And so many of you that have stayed up late with us really appreciate you joining us. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would really appreciate it if you could support us that way. For Andrew Lind, I'm Brendan Gulick. This is Buckeye Breakdown covering Ohio State 54 to 7. What a win. Buckeyes move to 6 and 1. See you tomorrow. We've got the whole crew together as we cover Ohio State with our instant analysis from Ohio State. There's something that doesn't feel right. Unbelievable effort from him today. Is EJ Liddell going to crack the first team all Big Ten? I think he can be the guy. I'm not trying to start a quarterback controversy. He seems to have the durability. He certainly has the toughness. This is the question on a lot of people's minds here. Welcome to Buckeye Breakdown.